Um, so as Rick said, my name is John Bedell. Um, to my own horn a little bit. I'm an Emmy winning reporter and also an anchor at uh, Channel 7, New Center 7, WHIO TV. Kind of depends on what you know it as, but we brand ourselves as New Center 7 when we're doing news content. Uh, Channel 7, if we're talking about like what's on CBS, because we're a CBS affiliate. Um, and I also uh, anchor on the weekends. I'm the morning and noon anchor on the weekends at Channel 7. And then on top of that, uh, some of you guys may or may not know, our parent company is Cox Media Group. So we're all under one roof down on South Main Street, kind of by UD. And we are Channel 7, the Dayton Daily News, News 95.7 WHIO Radio, and also our digital properties. So Dayton.com, all our websites for our stations, WHIO.com, DDN.com, MyDaytonDailyNews.com, and then some of our other radio stations you guys might know as K99. Uh, it's a country station here in town. And then 95.3, The Eagle. It's a classic rock station. Um, and then Dayton.com, which is a newer venture of ours, is also a Cox Media Ohio, Cox Media Group Ohio company. So under CMG Ohio, that's a big umbrella of just all our different uh, properties we have. So aside from my TV duties, I just do news. I'm a general assignment TV reporter. Uh, I do radio as well, because I started in radio uh, when I started working for uh, Cox after I graduated from UD. And I host our post-game show for UD men's basketball broadcast. We call it Flyer Feedback. Uh, it's just a post-game wrap. It's an hour-long show. I host it um, after home games. We have four former players that used to play at UD and are now local in the Dayton and Cincinnati area. Uh, they come and do the show with me, make me sound like I know what I'm talking about. And then for road games, we do it from our studios over on South Main Street. So for home games, it's really fun. I get to go to UD games. I said courtside and press row and all that, and I usually skip out um, in the second half, about half, a little, about three quarters of the way through the second half, because we do the show from Flanagan's Pub over on Stewart Street, kind of by campus, and I've got to be at Flanny's when the game is over, and a lot of UD fans like to leave the game early if you guys have ever gone to UD Arena for a game, so I've got to like skip out at the under eight timeout, so I have enough time to get to Flanagan's. And I do the show with uh, Brooks Hall, who's originally from Troy. He used to play at UD in the 90s. Uh, Nate Green, who was one of Brooks's teammates. Keith Walskowski, who was also one of Brooks's teammates. They all three played in the same era. And then Josh Pastorino, who played for Oliver Purnell and did the coaching thing before he came back home to Dayton. Josh is an Alter graduate, so uh, he's from the area as well. Um, so uh, for TV, a uh, little bit of what we do and how we do it. We start each day with um, an editorial meeting in the morning. We've got two of them because in TV there's a lot of shift work. So if you guys don't know now, that's not a Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 kind of thing. We've got people working overnights, mornings, days, nights. So we've got four different shifts that we've got people throughout the newsroom, whether it's reporters, producers, anchors, people on the desk, photogs, just everybody working all kinds of shifts. So we start the day with our morning editorial meeting at 9 uh, for the day side reporters and most of the managers because mo the majority of our folks work day side. 9 to 6.30-ish is as close as we get as the regular uh, schedule. So we start at 9. Uh, the, the managers all huddle from 9 to 9.15. The reporters come in at 9.15. We pitch all the stories we've got from uh, working our beats, from just stuff that's going on nationally that we might want to localize. Like last week I did a story on the Samsung Galaxy Note 7s with these things catching fire and Samsung saying we're not going to make them. We found a woman locally who has one, talked to her about that. So we pitch all our stories about what's going on and then the bosses talk about just in that room, what we want to do, what we don't like, and what we got to find uh, to fill content-wise our newscasts. And then we're sent out for the day at about 9.30 usually. You get out the door with the photographer. Uh, we have some people who are what we call one-man bands. Have you guys learned about those? You say you shoot and edit your own stuff. Uh, we have a handful of people who are one-man bands, but uh, most of our sister stations, it's, it's a common thing across um, Cox stations that we have in other cities and depending on your parent company of your station maybe it's more common to have reporter and photog teams um, at Cox that's the case that most of our sister stations all have reporters and photogs as opposed to one-man bands uh, so we go out we turn two stories today we do two packages um, and usually the majority of the time they're on two different things so we're not doing if there's something big like a really big story we're doing and there's enough for two packs. We'll do two packs of two different angles on the same story, but most days it's two different packages 
on two totally different topics. And usually you try to regionalize them to be kind of close to each other because you got to travel and do all the driving to get your video and stuff. Uh, so it's two day, we get out the door about 9.30, start working on the first one. As a day cider, sometimes our first newscast of the day that you have to be in is noon. So we have a noon and then we do a five, a 5.30 and a six for day cider. So you got a live uh, VOSAT, do you guys know this terminology? You guys learned like vocab? Some of you, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so a VOSAT's a shorter version of a story. It stands for voiceover sound on tape. A VO is video that the viewer is seeing while they're hearing either the reporter or the anchor. And then a SOT, it's kind of dated because we don't use tape anymore, but it's sound on tape. It's a sound bite we would use. So it's just me talking for 40 seconds and a sound bite, and that's an abbreviated version of a story as opposed to a package which is all edited and put together that you toss to and it plays for a minute and 15 seconds. So our first deadline's the noon, gotta have something in the noon, and then you gotta either wrap up that story that you're shooting after you're done at like 12.05, 12.10, or get to work on the second one, and you gotta turn both of those by, uh, we're in two of the three newscasts, either in your, you're in the five, 5.30 and the six, you're in two of those three with your stories. So in our business, there's a deadline every time you turn around. So the clock is never your friend, you've gotta learn to multitask, we're trying to get two stories done, and particularly with all the digital responsibilities we have now with being on social media throughout the day to let people know what you're working on, to let viewers know you're not just disappearing between noon and five, you're still working, uh, to tease ahead to content. We're shooting uh, what we call DOVs or digital only videos. That's the thing we do a lot at our place. Uh, things that people can watch online that we put to Facebook or Twitter uh, or we're on Instagram and we're starting to venture into Snapchat a little bit for the station. It's more individual reporters doing Snapchat, but not really a station as a whole. Um, but it's feeding the digital beast throughout the day because that's where the business is going. And that is where people increasingly, especially kids your age, are consuming their content. What's the first thing you guys grab when you wake up in the morning? Probably your phones. A lot of you guys use it as an alarm clock. So it's a lot of stuff on our app, a lot of stuff on social media. We have to create original content that people aren't going to see on the air to give them a reason to go to the digital uh, content. We call them snackable videos. You guys see these probably a lot on your Facebook feed, stuff you can watch without the sound up. Video pops up on your Facebook feed. It starts playing. It's got text over the video. Something real short and consumable throughout your day that tells you about a story we're working on. We call those snackables, a DOV, same kind of thing. So it's feeding that digital beast throughout the day. And then it's also trying to get your two stories written in time for the newscast at night. Same thing for the Nightsiders. They come in about 2. They have their editorial meeting at 2.15. They turn one pack in the 90 and then one for the 11 at night. And we've got two of those reporters who come in. Uh, and then the daybreak folks, they work mornings. They come in about 3 a.m. They're on the air from, uh, what is it, during the week, 5 to 7? 4.30 to 7. And they've got to turn, they're doing live, live Vosots all morning. It's a quicker pace in the morning. So you're at the top and bottom of the hour, uh, 5, 5.30, 6, 6.30, and then a 6.50 hit and teases in between all four or five of those hits. So you're live in the morning every time you turn around. And then you're in the noon, likely as a, day, or as a morning reporter, and then you're going to leave something for the evening newscast. Um, so it's just a crazy fast-paced kind of career. You're not at a desk. If you're a reporter, um, if you're a producer, you are. If you work on our assignment desk, you are. But if you're a reporter, it's really rare that you're in the newsroom much longer than maybe an hour total for a day. You're in there in the morning. You pitch once you get out the door. You're usually not coming back until you're done with your live shots to the 90. So there's never a slow day because you're always looking at some sort of deadline, whether it's for broadcast or digital or whatever. Um, and you got to learn, like I said, you got to learn to multitask. We have we spend a lot of our time in live trucks. It's a three seat big van. It's got a microwave dish. We got one satellite truck that can transmit uh, our stuff back to the station so we can go live. It's you and the photographer all day driving around in this truck. So your office is basically this truck. Two seats in the front and then we've got a whole bunch of space in the back where it's the seat that turns around uh, that can rotate. It's got all kinds of racks with our gear on it. It's got screens. It's got a laptop to edit. Um, all kinds of stuff. It's got card readers for our P2 cards that we shoot on to load the video into the system. It's basically a mobile newsroom for just one crew. Um, and what we do is we, you guys learn about logging, like transcribing video when you're done shooting. We do, we log all our video there, transcribe it, log and write. The photographer edits the package, 
or the Vosot or whatever we're doing in the truck, ships it back to the station, they put it online, so they have it back there. Um, so when you're uh, driving around, what I try to do, if I had the time, see we're doing one story in Kettering, we've got another story for whatever reason in somewhere like Springboro or Troy, somewhere that's a little farther away, I will sit, some reporters can't do this because they get motion sick. So if you guys get motion sickness, you can't be a reporter <laughs> or learn to, learn to control it if you do. Because uh, as you're driving forwards, you're facing backwards, logging video. What I'll do is transcribe as we're driving to save time. If we've got an hour drive somewhere, I'm gonna be logging in the back if we've already shot some stuff to multitask so I don't have that drive time just kind of twiddling my thumbs. You gotta just use every minute you can to try to get your work done while you have the chance. Uh, that's just learning to use your free time. Um, that's pretty much it for TV. I mean, we Rick told me to talk about, uh, do you guys really watch local news at your age? How do you guys consume, or how many of you, show of hands, how many of you guys watch local news, local TV news? All right. Is that because you guys are interested in the business a little bit, trying to get a, what's that? Okay. Yeah. So how many of you guys use, like she is saying, apps, news apps specifically, either network or your local stations? You guys use a lot of, okay. So what Rick was, uh, what we were discussing is that not a lot of kids your guys' age are watching local news. That's why there's this shift to the digital platform. And how many of you guys know what CBSN is, that digital network that CBS News has? 24-7, you just pull it up on your, their website, you watch it on any device you have, laptop, tablet, iPhone, Android, whatever. They are 24-7 digital newsroom. It just looks like a traditional newscast. They've got a desk, they've got producers all in the back, and they just have newscasts 24-7, and it is completely separate from CBS network. It's separate from what Scott Pelley's doing in the evening. That's eventually where TV is going, somewhere down the way. We don't know when that's going to be, but I would probably venture a guess. I don't know if you agree, Rick, but somewhere down the road, that's where TV is going. It, the, the whole industry, paper, TV, radio, everything's moving more and more digital now. So it's trying to figure out how to get there. Um, and I think Rick was saying that like the, the content, uh, a lot of viewers kind of wonder why so much as we call it crime and slime. A lot of shootings, a lot of fires, a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, as we say in the business, sometimes, sometimes if it bleeds, it leads. A lot of uh, crime and slime type stuff. And while it is, you know, we get some viewers who don't like that stuff, but for the most part, the numbers show, the research that we show, that we have, shows that's the kind of stuff that people want to watch. So if there's a shooting in Dayton or somewhere, it's what we try to do is we try to delve deeper than just oh, there was a shooting in Dayton today, or there was a shooting in, you know, Piqua or whatever. We'll try to find people directly affected by it and go a little deeper than that. We try to, what we call enterprise, find unique angles so it's not just reporting what happened. We're going to try and tell you why it happened, who was involved, and we're going to try to find the people directly involved uh, in that story to make it uh, more in-depth and, quite frankly, more interesting. Um, if there's a suspect that's involved in something, whether it's a shooting or they're arrested for whatever kind of crime, we're gonna dig really deeply into your background and find is this the first time you've done something like this? Uh, do you have any priors? Uh, who, what was your relationship to the people involved in you know, whatever kind of crime you pulled off? Um, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of in-depth, um, we try to bring like investigative kind of a feel to day turn stories um, and try to delve deeper than just, okay, beyond the surface of just telling people what happened, but why it happened, and more importantly, who are the people locally that it affects. Um, and kind of, as, kind of as a counter to that, one thing we've started for the last, I think it's been a little more than two years now, we do a segment, our main mail anchor, James Brown, does a segment he calls Making a Difference. And it's very similar to what um, they do it on the NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt on Fridays. And you guys, if you watch CBS Evening News on Fridays as well to close out the week, who knows who Steve Hartman is? Anybody heard of Steve Hartman? He does On the Road. It's kind of just a real, Steve Hartman is a tremendous storyteller. Uh, won a lot of awards over his career, and he does a segment on Fridays called On the Road, 
and it's just a feel-good story. They find somebody. Uh, I don't know how he finds these people, but he just finds really good stories across the country, and it's just a feel-good, kind of uplifting thing to close out the week, and it's the very last package they play on the evening news on Friday on CBS, and it's kind of a feel-good. As soon as that pack's done, they sign off. So what we've done with James is he does a monthly segment called Making a Difference, and he finds somebody in our community that is making a difference. He did a story last month about a group of women who meet at Bill's Donuts. You guys ever been to Bill's? You guys got to been to Bill's before, right? Okay. So on Tuesdays, this group of women meets at Bill's, and you guys know that side room? As you come in the back entrance, there's that side room off to your right before you turn and the counter's on your left. They fill that space, and they bring trash bags or just shopping bags from like Kroger or Dorothy Lane Market or wherever, those plastic shopping bags, and they weave them together. They do crochet, and they make mats for homeless people to sleep on, and they crank out. I mean, it, I think it, they said it was like 40 hours of work for one of these. Um, so he went and featured this whole group about why they do it, how it got started, interviewed the owner of Bills, and why she lets them use this space, and I think she helps too. So that's the kind of thing we do in response to, oh my gosh, you know, because we got a lot of viewers that say, why is there so much crime and slime kind of stuff? We want something uplifting. So as a direct response to that, James has been doing this for two years now, and it's one of the most popular segments we do. He does one on Friday, the last week of every month, and then one on Saturday, which is a totally different version and a little longer that we run on Saturday mornings when I'm anchoring. And people, we get calls. Like after the air, we get calls in the newsroom for like this Bill's Donuts one. How can I help? Can I donate my bags to what they're doing? Um, he'll get calls all about these different organizations and people that he features if they have something where just people in the community are able to help. We get flooded with calls, and James gets a ton of emails and Facebook messages about how can I help these people, or do you guys have a link to that story? I want to watch it again. So that's kind of how we've, at least locally at Channel 7, kind of balanced out um, just the news industry as a whole. That's not something that's unique to Channel 7. There's just a lot of you know, kind of bad news that, that tends to be covered, but that the research numbers show is kind of what people want to see and want to know about when it happens, whether nationally um, you know, or locally, just uh, here in the Miami Valley. Um, so yeah, cover a pretty big area. I think we have 11 counties. We go as far south as Butler, Warren, and Clinton. We go as far north as Auglaize County up to Wapakoneta. And then we go as far west as my beat, which is Preble and Wayne County. So we go into Richmond, Indiana. We go east to Xenia. And on the eastern, northeast side, we go all the way up to uh, Logan County. So Urbana, Urbana Champaign County. What's the county seat up there? Uh, Bell Fountain. We go up to Bell Fountain a lot too. So it's a big area we cover, uh, large local area. And we're cranking out, I think it's six and a half hours of newscast every day because we're on from 4.30 to 7.00. And then noon for a half hour, 5 to 6.30, and then 11. And then by the time the 11's done, the producers for the morning show are already in the newsroom and starting to stack and write what is uh, going to be on the air at 4.30. So it's a constant, constant animal, constant beast you got to feed with, with content. Um, and it's, like I said, there's never a slow day. I love it. It's a crazy business, but uh, it's a lot of fun. So you guys got any questions? Yes. What's the most challenging part about like your everyday work there? I would say two things. Probably coming up with the content, because that's a challenge. Having to pitch two stories a day mm -hmm. and two turnable stories. It's not just, hey, let's do you know, use like a throw out. You've got to pitch something that is turnable and that is doable. And I would say the time crunch, like I said, the clock is just never, never your friend in our business. So it's always trying to manage your deadlines. Yes. Have you ever like had a day where you haven't found any content at all? And if you did or did not, what would that really mean to you? How many times do you have to like have a day like that so they get like Ugh, so they like might fire you or something? <laughs> <laughs> not fire, but yeah, there's days where you know uh, you gotta. One of my, one of our photogs says uh, a cat in a tree is not a lead unless all you got is a cat in a tree. So there's days where, and I'm sure, Rick, you know this in the business after years of doing it, there's days where you might not have the most, you know, incredible lead stories or whatever, but so you just got to make do. It's, it's, uh, those days are few and far between, but, you know, maybe once a month you're just going to get a day where it's just 
maybe not a whole lot's happening lo locally and just having a struggle coming up with some stuff. But how do you how do you, uh, your superiors feel when when you kind of turn up with nothing? That's not good. Yeah. <laughs> you you should <laughs> never yeah. Then you get called into the principal's office. Yeah, you can't. Uh, you, it's a bad idea to come to work with no. And that, that's part of your job as a reporter too is you know keeping in touch with your sources working your beats, and just really paying attention to local stuff that's going on, like the, like the Samsung thing. That's an easy story that's national that you can localize because uh, we have numbers that show, I don't know how, but uh, our digital folks have research that shows that for whatever reason, Dayton is a predominantly Android market. There's a lot more Androids in the Dayton area than there are iPhones. Um, so that was a story that affected a lot of people in our area. Was it the S7 or the S7 Note? The Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Okay. Yeah. If that was a note, I'd you just turn it off. <laughs> yes. What did you have for breakfast? <laughs> they teach us to do that as a. Did they teach you guys to do that for a mic check? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I had uh, I had a bowl of uh, was it honey bunches? Yeah, honey bunches of oats with a cut up banana in it. I tell people to do that for a mic check all the time. Yes. Do you have any special talents? Oh, yeah. Good. I can. I don't have one with me here in Dayton, but it's still at my parents' house. Um, I can play a didgeridoo. Do you guys know what that is? Yeah. 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 So my uncle Jack, uh, one of my dad's brothers, works for Steris. You know, they make the hand sanitizer stuff. They're based there, or they have a big presence in Cleveland. And my uncle Jack works for them, and he's uh, VP of business development for Steris. So he travels a lot abroad and when we were kids uh he came back he goes to australia a lot for them and he came back one summer with a legit eucalyptus didge because if you guys have seen him so a didgeridoo is just a eucalyptus tree trunk and they're hacked off at the ends and they're made in different diameters and lengths for different keys and different pitches and i think his was like a d so it was about this tall and they're, they're gorgeous. I mean, they're painted up, the Aborigines paint them up in these gorgeous, gorgeous colors and designs, this gorgeous artwork on the outside of them. And then they're hollowed out. Uh, the trunk is, after they're cut down, they're hollowed out using fire sticks and termites. So it's a really like crude way of hollowing these things out, but they sound really cool. It's like a drone. And then the mouth uh, piece is beeswax. You melt beeswax in a pot and you dip it and rotate it, pull it out, let it cool. And you just do that, you keep doing that over and over again so it layers it. And uh, so, yeah, I can play a didgeridoo. The one I have at home is plastic, but uh, I really want to get like a eucalyptus one, but they're crazy expensive. They're like 500 bucks. There's a store in California that makes them. You can order a eucalyptus didge and have it shipped to your home. But they're like five, eight hundred dollars. They're crazy, crazy expensive instruments. That, that sounds really cheap, though, because I'm looking at three thousand dollar trumpets over here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, Rick. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm originally from Akron. I'm just like LeBron James in that way. I'm exactly like LeBron James in that way. I'm just a kid from Akron. Uh, so I was born in Akron, and my parents still live in the Akron area today. And I went to high school up there, obviously. Went to Walsh Jesuit. We play. We would play like altar a lot in football and volleyball and that kind of thing. Um, and then I went to UD. Came to UD because my guidance counselor at Walsh was a UD graduate. He went to UD and graduated in 54. Uh, so Bill loved UD and he sent a ton of Walsh kids down here just because he would have them check it out. And for me, I just went down to check out campus and uh, totally fell in love with it at the first visit. And then my cousin, Max, who was a year ahead of me, who actually went to St. V's where LeBron went. Max was uh, a freshman at UD, my senior year at college, or at, uh, in high school. So after the visit, I came down, spent a night with Max, checked it out from a student's perspective, crashed in his dorm room and all that. Ended up coming here for college. And at UD, I did kind of classes like you guys are taking here, just at the college level. Had Rick for one, two classes. I took Rick for uh, COM 201, which is Intro to Mass Com, and then uh, PR campaigns. And uh, I was an electronic major. So at UD, there's no journalism school. There's just a department of communication. I took... Uh, E-media was my concentration within the comm department, so that's basically broadcast journalism. Different schools call it different things. 
Uh, and I was really active with the student newspaper, Flyer News, to try to keep my written word up. Uh, took a whole bunch of audio and video production classes, broadcast performance, stuff like that. Was really active with the student radio station, uh, WUDR. Was the sports director my senior year. And also did a little bit of Flyer TV. I did a lot more radio in college than I did TV, but we also have a student TV station where we were turning by senior year. We were doing a weekly show, turning content, shooting, writing, editing, all that kind of thing, getting practice with that. And then uh, senior year, I'd had a bunch of different irons in the fire for job prospects. God, I started looking at like October. Um, I was a few steps along the way with ESPN to may maybe go out to Bristol and be a production assistant. Uh, that just ended up not working out. Um, a couple other things I was looking at. And then the last week of school, uh, the week leading up to graduation, our faculty advisor for Flyer News, the student newspaper, Larry Lane, uh, we had a communication awards department dinner that night, Tuesday at the student union. Larry comes up to me and says, hey, I got a uh, lead on a job in Dayton. Would you mind staying in Dayton for work? And I said, no, not really. I mean, I don't, you know, Dayton's okay. I mean, campus is kind of a bubble. You don't really get off campus a whole lot when you go to UD. Um, but I was like, yeah, you know, I don't have anything for sure yet. I'll check it out. Borrowed my roommate's car that Friday to drive up to our old station on Wilmington Avenue. It was right across the street. You guys know where Stan the Donut Man is? Yeah. It's right across the street from there. Uh, it's, it got demolished. We sold it. It's like storage sheds now. Uh, but that was where our old station was. And I brought my roommate's car to drive up there for the interview. It was for a part-time gig as a web writer and as a reporter uh, for radio. Interviewed, got the job that day. Was there for a few hours. The interview, tour in the place and everything. They offered me the job. I took it. Uh, graduated two days later on Sunday. Went to Daytona and partied my face off for a week. And then went back to Akron for like five days, maybe and turned around and moved back to, to Dayton uh, to start working. And I was working four to nine in the morning. So here I was like being out until four in the morning down in Daytona and then coming to Dayton and, and, and getting up at that time to be at work at four. And I was working those hours and I would do, uh, I would help write content for the radio anchors for the morning show, Miami Valley's morning news, because it's a ton, if you guys ever listen, five to nine during the week on 95.7 FM or AM 1290. It is so fast paced and there is so much content coming at you so quickly for radio because radio writing, as you guys know, is like take the meat and potatoes of whatever you're talking about and throw out the meat and then that's like the condensed radio version. You've got like 15, 20 seconds to tell a story. The radio and Irish? What's that? The radio and Irish? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, so uh, there's a lot of content to write, so I was helping take some of the load off the anchors. I was writing web versions of the stories for our website. Um, before we merged, we had like separate web writers for each station. And then eventually I was reporting for them. I would, I would be going out. Uh, we had a really big fire. We had an arson in east, on the east side of Dayton right at Springfield and East 3rd, and this arsonist had set like three houses on fire, and then two of them have caught two other houses on fire. So there was like five houses burning at the same time on this one block and it was the entire Dayton Fire Department was out there literally and some other uh, city firefighters as well helping them with this. So I would go out and report on things like that. Um, I remember doing live reports like the day before Thanksgiving at the Dayton International Airport, big travel day. Worked my way up to over the winter by like December I was anchoring newscasts uh, and then was kind of doing here and there TV work, just little things for, for TV with knowing I wanted to get into it eventually, or hopefully at Channel 7. And then by February, this was the Friday before uh, Packers Steelers Super Bowl in 2011, uh, TV came to me and said, hey, we want to make you full time. We had moved over to our new building by then. Um, can you just sit tight until we can get you know, everything with HR figured out, you know, get your paperwork done and all that. In the meantime, you're, you're clear to work full time radio hours. Um, because then Super Bowl Sunday, <laughs> our evening anchor for radio, no called, no showed, and they fired him. He got fired. So that Monday, uh, they're like, well, Fidel, you're going to be the evening anchor for, for radio. You're still part-time, but you go ahead and work 40 hours, and you'll just work for us uh, full-time, full-time, until uh, TV comes through with you know, getting their hire finalized. 
That ended up being until May 1. So I worked the rest of February, March, and April as just doing evenings for radio and doing my post-game basketball stuff. And then my first day on the job for TV was the day we killed Osama bin Laden, May 1st. It was that Sunday, into mo that Monday was my first day. And Sunday night was when the president really late that night came on and said, we got him, we killed bin Laden. So my first day, that was, that was, a, that was quite a day to be in a newsroom because that was a huge, how old were you guys when that happened, by the way? That was 2011. So you guys are... God, you guys make me feel old. Okay. But you guys are old enough. You guys are certainly old enough to remember it. Yeah. So that, I mean, that was a huge deal. That was a cool, that was a really cool first day to be in a newsroom because it was just uh, everybody going crazy, trying to figure out, you know, the different angles of how do we cover it locally? What do we do? And obviously a massive, because it kind of broke, I mean, really late overnight. I mean, the president came out, I think it was like close to midnight. So it was a huge story Monday because it was all still new. So I was just still shadowing that week and learning the ropes. Um, but that was an interesting first week to be on the job. Yeah. Uh, it's work. So that was fun. I think you mean the best player in hide and seek. And then uh, I did the reporting. So that was a full-time reporter at that point, and I did that for uh, a little more than three years, and then no, a little more than two years. And then in 2013, I. Uh, signed a contract extension to stay with Channel 7, and that's when I took the weekend anchor gig, um, and that's been since September of 2013. So um, my, uh, I mentioned the shift work earlier. So my schedule kind of shifts based on NFL football, which is good. It's nice because I like football. I'm a Browns fan, which is awful lately, but um, my wife's a Bengals fan, so if you guys are Bengals fans, I'm kind of sympathetic to them these days. Anyways, um, so I mentioned the shift work thing. Uh, very few people in our business have Saturday, Sunday off. My weekend right now is Sunday, Monday, and that's because, uh, as I mentioned, I do weekend mornings and the noon. So on Saturdays, always, 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 we do 6 to 7, 8 to 10 a.m., and then a noon newscast, which is just a half hour, and I'm off at 12.30. So on Saturdays, I work like 4 a.m. to 1 in the afternoon. And then on Sundays, I also anchor the noon, and I produce it as well for myself. So I get in about seven to get that all done to produce it and stack it and write it. But if we don't have a noon on Sundays, I just don't work. And during the NFL season, because we're a CBS affiliate and we carry NFL football, the NFL today, their pregame show comes on at noon. So if there's no noon, I just don't work. So this time of year, I'm off Sunday, Monday. And then outside the NFL season, which is basically mid-February to just after Labor Day, I'm off Tuesday, Wednesday. So there's not a lot of... Um, kind of typical work weeks. You're working, like I said, a lot of shift work. Like most of my, most of my shifts are days, but I work anywhere from four day shifts and a morning shift to three day side shifts and two morning shifts a week. So it's a little goofy, just something to be aware of that. And you gotta work a lot of holidays too. You gotta start, you have to work up seniority at a station, and at least if you're doing TV news, um, before you are able to get like Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter and that kind of stuff off. So, yes. Um, is the newsfield growing enough to where like there's more opportunities for new hirees and stuff like that? Oh yeah, I mean TV is still doing TV is still going really strong, um, particularly with all the digital elements of all the platforms, radio, paper, TV, and digital itself. There's a lot, lot of digital jobs. And even on air, there's uh, even even on air jobs. It's you know you might have to go somewhere to get your start. That's like, you know, Butte, Montana, or Zanesville, Ohio, or Steubenville. You know, smaller markets. Um, I was I was fortunate enough to start in Dayton, which um, is you guys learned about Nielsen and their rankings and ratings and stuff like that. Okay, so Nielsen ranks markets based on the amount of TV households in a metropolitan area. So New York, biggest city in America. One, LA two, Chicago three, so on and so forth. So usually the bigger the city, the larger the market. Dayton right now is 64. So we're the 64th largest TV market in the country based on Nielsen's latest ratings for 16, 17. Usually you gotta start, it's not unusual to start in a market that's in the 100s, 110, 120. Somewhere like Zanesville, Lima is a common place. A lot of kids that I know have started. Uh, and then you work your way up to Bigger markets in our business, a lot of people say you either want to go up in market size or you want to go home. 
and for a lot of people, that's both. Home for me is Cleveland, uh, but Dayton slash Cincinnati has also kind of become my second home. I met my wife here. She's from Cincinnati. Um, so, yeah, there's plenty of jobs still. Yes? What's the hardest story you've had to work on? Hardest story? What made it hard? Uh, I would probably say... The it, cause we, it was a weekend full of the coverage too. I was just emotionally drained after that weekend. It was the Aurora, Colorado theater shooting, because we had a family uh, from Springfield who lost a son. Uh, his name is Matt McQuinn. Matt was in his mid twenties when he was killed. He was one of the people who died that night, shielding someone they were with from the gunfire. In his case, it was his at the time girlfriend, Sam Yowler, and Sam is from, is from uh, St. Paris up in Champaign County. Her dad is a fire chief in one of those communities. And they were dating, had both been from this area, and they were both working for Target and had moved out to Aurora to be near Sam's brother. And they were just getting ready to move back to the Dayton area to get married and all this. And uh, Matt, like I said, as uh, Holmes, burst in and started shooting, Matt dove on top of Sam. She was shot in her left leg and survived. Matt was shot something like seven or nine times and he was one of the people who died in that theater. His parents, um, I forget how we got a hold of them. I don't know if they reached out to us. We, we were certainly looking for them and that's on a daily basis, the hardest part of our job is we are often dealing with people in the worst moments of their life. If you've got somebody arrested for some nasty crime or if uh, in your family, or if you have a death in the family, often we're coming to you to talk to you. And a lot of, we get a lot of vitriol, as you might imagine, for people. Now for some families, it's therapeutic. And the McQuins were one example of this. They came to us and said, we wanna talk about Matt because we don't want as many of the families, some of the families, and they're one of them from the shooting, they do not say the shooter's name in their household. They do not out James Holmes. He is the gunman, or they just don't say his name, or the defendant, or whatever. They do not speak his name in their home because it's too painful for them. And uh, Matt's mom uh, has not been back to work since this happened. She's just been too traumatized by this whole thing. And they came to us and said, we want to talk about Matt because we, we don't want to focus on this gunman. We want people's stories like Matt's, and you saw a lot of this after Aurora, a lot of the victim's family saying this exact same thing. We want the focus to be on who our loved ones were. We want that to be what lives out of this horrible shooting and not whatever the heck was on his mind and whatever he wanted to pull off, we're not gonna give him this attention that he wants. So we had done, the shooting happened on a Thursday. It was a, it was a Friday morning because it was a midnight release of The Dark Knight Rises. So it happened really early in the morning our time. It was a midnight in Aurora, so it was like 3 or 4 a.m. our time. So we had spent all day Friday doing it. When Once we had figured out by like 9, 8, 8 9 a.m. our time that it was Matt, and we had, a, we had a local connection. Spent all day Friday doing it. They called us Saturday morning and said, we want to talk. Ended up going and speaking to his stepfather, David, because Jerry, his mom, was out in Colorado, one of those families that waited 24 hours before they knew Matt was dead, officially. And we did like two stories on it on Saturday. And I think we even followed up with more Aurora stuff Sunday. And it was just being buried so deep in that story of what had happened, which is horrible. And then on top of that, you're having a direct, I had a direct impact with David and Jerry by extension of seeing like the tremendous amount of emotional pain they were going through. And I just remember on that Monday, just feeling so emotionally weighed down and just exhausted after that weekend and just sort of, uh, you know, kind of, so that was definitely the, now out of the wake of that, I've developed a really good relationship with the Jacksons and they have been one of the families, I don't know how they do it, but they have been so tremendously strong in the wake of losing Matt. They do charity events for him. They do a weekly run walk for him to raise money. They do all, they, they, they've done a really good job of turning their grief into action and, and something, something else to help them cope with losing Matt, because it's just as, you talk to them, it's just as fresh today as it was, you know, when that happened in 2012. 
And then the door knocks on ex like the daily stuff I talk about, like trying to find people, the door knocks of like somebody who's just died in a car wreck or a shooting or something. That's awful. <laughs> that's the part of the job that everybody in the newsroom just despises. That's not something we enjoy. I had some woman yell at me a couple weeks ago and uh, we were out in New Lebanon. We had a, a crash where somebody was killed. It was a gentleman who was hit and killed. Um, and we had to go find the, the home where the car ended up because the driver deputies told us keep, keep, kept driving and ended up back at home where she was at. And they had gone to the home, deputies had, and towed this car as evidence. So we went there trying to find, knock on a door, try to find somebody there to talk to us. And the neighbor across the street just, you guys are vultures, you're just preying on people, you know. So you get a lot of that, and it, you got to just kind of take it when that happens because there's a lot of emotions running high when, you know, neighbors or the people there don't like you, you know, obviously showing up in their worst moments. But the reason, I'll say this, the reason we do that is because when we have a victim of something, especially if they're prominent, like we had a lot of tragic stuff um, where, like when we lose high schoolers, you know, young people to like car wrecks, we had a really horrible one a couple of years ago that killed three girls from Bellbrook, um, Sophie Kerrigan, uh, and some others, two others. Um, and even what happened to one of your guys' classmates here the weekend at Walter Fest. When we have stuff like that, the reason we go to families, and like I said, for some like the McQuins, it's therapeutic. Your classmate's uh, mother was one that was like that. She wanted to speak about her son. We go to do that because we don't want to just, re we want to let people know we don't want them to be just a victim of a shooting or a car wreck or something. We want people to know who they were as a person. We want to present to viewers who, who this person was beyond just, well, they were a victim of a shooting or they died in a car crash. We want to really have families have the opportunity to tell um, who they were and who the person they loved was. Um, and that can be okay sometimes when you get families that, that want to talk, but it's also really nerve wracking walking up to a door to have to make that door knock a lot of times. So that's, that's probably the worst, really long answer, but that's the worst part of the job. Uh, uh, one more question, go ahead. Yeah. How would you word that? Like, how would you be able to like, go up to the door to somebody like who just, you know, lost, how would you be able to, like, how would, how would you word like, hey, can we do this or? Uh, you never start with that. Yeah, well, I, I know. Yeah, no, and it's tough. It's, I, I do it, I'm, I'm pr probably sure however many times I've done it, there's probably been a different approach every time. And I don't, I, I, that's something I ask reporters in our newsroom constantly about. People that are on the same experience level as me and particularly more veteran people, like, what do you what do? Because do? it's so difficult. But you always, you, can, you gotta go in with a mindset that you can't, you can't make what's happening any better, really, for them. You, know, you can try to help a little bit, because um, it can be therapeutic. But you just say, look, I'm so sorry to be here. You know, it's the last thing, you know. I, you hate to bother them, but you say, I'm so sorry. First of all, you got to say you're sorry for what they're going through. And a lot of times, you know, 100% of the time, that's true. So you want to relate with them on a personal level. You don't want to just shove a camera in their face. First of all, you don't bring the camera with you. You leave that away. And you just talk to them and try to connect with them personally and say, I'm so sorry what you're going through. And you, I, I try to converse with them a little bit before you, you finally pull out, hey, you know, can we, we just want to have a conversation with you guys on camera to let people know who this was and who they were to you is could we you know could we talk to you guys and just sit down and talk about who they were so a lot of time I had a dad a couple weeks ago told me yeah I just really appreciate the chance to do that so you never know I was gonna say it makes a lot more sense to like cover the victim and you know just like 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 you said you know tell who they were the them you know to cover the yeah. uh, Yeah, and that goes back to what I was talking about earlier, that you, you get beyond just, hey, this happened, and you tell, you story tell. So. John, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, guys. You're welcome.